Hello, everybody. Gonna let some people come in here. Hi, everyone. Just gonna let a few people come in. Going to be doing a pie crust demo 101 today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be doing this with my friends from Designer Appliances. So when you get here, guys, be sure to just send me an invite, a request to join our live here. Hi, hi, Ro, friend of mine's tuning in, hi. <laughs> or May, I guess it could be either of you. <laughs> so, hey guys, I'm gonna be making a uh, little bit of a pie crust 101 demo today. My friends have gone ahead and requested, so let me get them in here. We're waiting for my friends at Designer Appliances. We are gonna be doing Pie Crust 101, guys. So if you've got questions, be sure to send them down here. My brand new book, The Book on Pie, is coming out tomorrow, and I'm so excited. So I'm really excited uh, to show you guys some Pie Crust 101 tips together today. So let's get, give it one more minute here. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Jeff said he just purchased my book this morning. Thanks so much. Be sure to let me know, guys. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the kind of question comment thing down below. And also our co-host today is going to be sending me some of your questions as well. So I'm just waiting for my friends at Designer Appliances. I just sent you another request, guys. Yep, here he is. Hello. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, Let me just turn great. my camera around here and get in my setup. Awesome. Here we go. How are you? Uh, we're doing great. Thanks so much for having us. We're excited about the release of the new book. Yes, I'm so excited too. And I'm excited to get into some pie crust, some pie crust deep information today. Some 101, starting at the kind of the base here, right? Nice. Um, so we actually prepped ourselves this weekend at my house. Um, I'd never making a pie before. So me and my wife and the kids, actually, uh, we heard on your interview with uh, Kristen Miglor the, uh, that your favorite was coconut custard. So we tried to make a co coconut custard pie out of one of your recipes. Um, we didn't finish it because we didn't realize it was going to take four hours in the fridge. <laughs> but uh, I think I have my like trials and tribulations of what it takes to make a pie crust. So I should have some of my own questions too. Well, that's one of the things that I always say is pie doesn't, um, it, it, it's not necessarily that hard, but it defies impatience. Yep. So you cannot be impatient when it comes to a pie. There are some hands off kind of periods where it has to hang out in the fridge and stuff. Um, so let's just like jump right in to my classic pie dough recipe, if that works for you. And then just throw great. some questions at me as we get going here. Sounds great. Um, so the few things you're gonna need for my pie dough, I keep my pie dough really basic. So one of the reasons that I keep it basic is that way I can use it for both sweet pies and savory pies. So I don't even add any sugar to my pie dough. My pie dough is just all purpose flour, some salt, some butter, lots of butter, and some water. So um, I'm gonna make a double crust recipe for you all today. So for that, that would be a bottom crust and a top crust or two single crust pie recipes. So this is um, two and a half cups or 300 grams if you're a, a hardcore baker like me, we like to do it in weight. Um, so of all purpose flour. And I've also got about a half teaspoon of fine sea salt. And I'm just gonna mix that in with my hands. I like to mix my pie dough by hand, and that's gonna be the first thing that I'm gonna talk about here is how much I like to mix it by hand. But um, for those of you who have naturally really warm hands, there are other tools that you can utilize. Um, a pastry cutter is one, which is sort of like a series of blades on a handle, or you can use the food processor. Um, the process is still gonna be the same in terms of the visual cues that you're looking for. So. You can just kind of substitute in your mind if you're planning on using one of those other tools other than your hands. But for me, that's one of my favorite parts about making pies, like getting my hands all floury and making the dough. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so with the, uh, I think when we were doing it, 
yesterday, um, I think it quickly went from, uh, from maybe like big chunks to little chunks. So it seems like there's kind of a sweet spot. Absolutely. And actually how big you want those chunks kind of depends on the end result that you're going for. Um, I have a great picture of this in my book and maybe I'll, after my hands are not buttery, maybe I'll show you this picture. <laughs> so to give you some more of a visual cue, but um, it's, when you want kind of a flaky pie dough, which is usually what I want, anyone who follows me knows I'm a fan of the flakiness. The flaky pie dough is my thing. Um, so if you want it flaky, I like to leave it about this so that the largest pieces are about the size of walnut hat. And that's a lot bigger than a lot of recipes tell you to do it. A lot of recipes say to mix it to be about the size of peas. But I find that mixing it to be about the size of peas actually makes a very mealy, crumblier texture and a little less flaky. And that mealy or crumblier texture is also delicious. It would be a little bit better for like a custard pie or a cream pie, something that's higher in moisture. And then you can use flaky doughs when you're making fruit pies because that flakiness really works beautifully with fruit. Um, also, there's another little tip that you can do um, that I talk about in my new book. Um, you can enlist the help of a couple of folds in the process of making the dough. This is something I learned from a chef of mine in pastry school who said, you know, it doesn't need to be full rough puff pastry. What rough puff pastry is, is basically similar to pie dough, but it is folded many times to create these really light, fluffy layers. And you can actually do that with pie dough without doing as many folds as you would need to make something like puff pastry. And it just gives it a little bit of extra flakiness. And I also find that it really helps some of the crimps and um, kind of decorative effects to stay better in the oven. So that's another little thing that you can do. If you're doing that, that is a process that would happen after we mix the dough. So again, you don't need to decide that right away. You can kind of decide after mixing it if you feel like you want to give it a little boost of extra flakiness. Do you have a favorite type of butter you like to use? So I use so much butter that I admit I usually go for whatever's on sale because okay. I go through a lot of butter and butter can be kind of pricey. So um, I, I don't have necessarily a specific brand, but I do recommend using unsalted butter because again, we're adding salt into the recipe. If you only have salted butter at home or, you know, that, that's great. Just you're not going to want to add as much salt to the dough itself. So that's just a little bit of a give and take. Generally speaking, I call for unsalted butter in my recipes. Another reason I call for unsalted butter too is because you can incorporate other ingredients that might be salty, like cheese. Oh, okay. So, um, okay, so I went ahead and chopped up two sticks of unsalted butter, which is uh, eight ounces or 226 grams. And now what I'm gonna do is start working with it. If you were using a tool or a food processor, you would just obviously do it with that tool rather than your hands. But what I'm doing, and um, my handy camera person might come in, and by camera person, I mean my husband, who has become my unofficial camera person during the, uh, so this is what we're gonna do. You can kind of see I've shingled them, but I just kind of squeeze it between my thumb and fingers like that. And that's what we're trying to do. We're kind of trying to flatten the butter rather than just crumble it into smaller pieces, if that makes sense. <laughs> and do you want all of the flour to be combined or is it okay if some extra flour is left there? Uh, you kind of, it's gonna kind of be at different stages. So like right now you can see that there's a lot of butter over here, but mm -hmm. what we want to do is every now and then when you're working, you want to toss it to re-coat those shingled pieces of butter with flour. And we'll just kind of keep doing that throughout this process. The process of mixing is gonna take, you know, a few minutes here, especially doing it by hand. If you were doing this in the food processor, you would do it kind of in pulses, you know, in, instead of, and you're not gonna get this same kind of effect of the shingle, which is really what makes incredible flakiness. The reason that this makes a pie dough flaky is kind of interesting to understand because it makes it makes it a little bit easier to know why you're working so hard to make the dough that certain way. Um, so one of the reasons that you do this is because we're trying to create little pieces of butter kind of all throughout the dough, right? I love how when I held up my hand, flour came tumbling off it, by the way. I need to not gesticulate so much when I've got flour hands. Um, so 
basically when the butter is incorporated and it's in these thin little pieces, when it hits the heat of a really hot oven and the butter and the dough itself is very cold, right? Pido loves to be cold at all stages, keep it cold. When in doubt, chill it out. That's the rule of Pido. Um, so when that really cold dough hits the heat of a very hot oven, we're talking somewhere between 400 and 425 degrees Fahrenheit, the moisture in the butter evaporates. And what it does is it evaporates very quickly, creating like this little puff of steam. And that steam is actually what gives us the flaky layers. So that's why it's so important for the pie dough to be cold, for the butter to be cold, for the oven to be hot. If it isn't, if the dough is a little bit warm or sticky or the oven isn't quite preheated yet, you end up with the butter kind of melting all over your oven and it can be a real disaster. So that's what we want to avoid. Keep everything nice and cold, get your oven nice and hot, and that's how you get the flakiest pie dough. Okay, great. Do we have any questions from anybody else? I know that there were a couple questions coming into that question tab when you first started. Yeah, so we, uh, we definitely have a few questions from some of our uh, followers as well that came in Great. Um, just the other day. So one of the first questions was, how do you keep your pie crust from shrinking? Great question. So one of the biggest reasons that pie dough will shrink has to do with it not getting enough rest time. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're mixing something with flour in it, um, you're kind of creating the, the natural proteins that exist in flour create these strands of protein called gluten. And gluten in baking, you know, is, is a very good word usually, but it can also give things a lot of structure, that protein, that. So whenever you are working something that has hydrated flour, as we're gonna hydrate this pie dough in a few minutes, whenever you're working with something that has hydrated flour, you're kind of needing to give it some time for the dough to relax, for those protein strands that have formed to kind of soften and if you've ever had that problem also when you roll out your dough, and no matter how much you roll it out, it just keeps shrinking back when you're rolling it out. That's usually just because it needs a little bit more time to rest. Um, so give it a little bit of time. Sometimes I tell people, just make your pie dough the day before you need it, and then you won't even have to worry about that aspect. But the second reason that shrinking can happen is in the oven. Um, it often happens because people don't chill the dough quite enough, or maybe the oven isn't quite hot enough, so again, the dough kind of starts to melt and slide down the pie plate instead of forming its structure. But um, the other reason is that when you're doing a certain step, there's a step in pie baking known as PAR or blind baking. PAR baking stands for partially baking a crust, and you might do that for something like a pumpkin pie. Um, and blind baking is when you fully bake the crust. That's what you might do for like the coconut cream pie because the yep. custard is put in um, after the pie dough is already baked. So <clears throat> the shrinking in that case usually happens because people don't use enough pie weights. So the pie weights actually have to come, sorry, let me clap some of this flour off my hands. The pie weights actually have to come all the way up to the top rim of the pie plate. And if they don't, if they only cover the bottom, there's nothing supporting the sides. So that's one of the biggest issues that I see is that people just don't use quite enough pie weights. And then in the oven, that, that dough is just butter. So, you know, it just wants to kind of fall down and shrink. So that's how you can avoid it. Keeping things so that brings up my main question too, is we were, I guess this fell into the category of we didn't read the whole recipe first. So we got everything we needed except for pie weights. Um, so when it came to that step, we ended up not having anything. I was looking around the kitchen for anything that would fit <laughs> just to hold it down a little bit. Uh, if you don't have pie weights, is there anything you can use for that same effect? Yeah, definitely. So dried beans are one of the most common things that people oh. use. Um, you can just use dried beans or even rice or a grain. The downside of using those ingredients is that they can't usually be cooked and consumed afterwards. So it's a little bit wasteful, but mm. you can use them as pie weights dozens of times before you need to get rid of them. And one of my favorite pie baking people out in the world, the amazing Stella Parks, has an incredible method where she uses sugar as the pie weight. Um, mm. That scares some people because they think the sugar might melt or kind of create a disaster in the oven, but it doesn't. Instead, it actually kind of toasts and becomes this golden color. So if you're making a pie, the chances are you do have sugar in your house, most likely. 
And Stella has proved that you can use sugar as a pyrate, which is really incredible. And you can still use the sugar later, so it's not wasteful, which is great. Interesting. So when it, so on our pie crust, it actually it did start to rise up. Um, since we didn't get a chance to actually try the pie yet, um, I mean, what is the negative effect of that? What's what's going to happen on my end result? Um, your dough kind of puffed up, you mean? Yeah, in the middle, it seems like it raised up a little bit. Uh, but it did. Yeah. It looks like it came golden brown, basically across the entire crust, which I think was a positive sign. Yes, it's a very positive sign. It's also a positive sign that it did puff up because that means that you made a flaky dough. Um, oh. It wouldn't puff up if there wasn't some kind of flakiness going on because of that kind of steam thing I just described a little while ago with the butter. So that's really a good sign. Um, the actual truth is the better you make your dough, the more problematic it's going to be to not have the weights because it'll just puff up so much that there will be no place to put the filling. You know, it'll just kind uh -oh. of rise. But that said, that is something you can usually kind of um, adjust even during baking by just kind of stabbing it with a fork or a paring knife again, and it will the air that was caught under there will kind of deflate. Oh, so, so it's okay to put holes in the in the bottom. It's okay to put a couple of holes. You don't want to put big giant holes, but usually okay. if you just poke a couple tiny holes, that's not enough for filling to get through or to be problematic. And if you want to be extra sure, you can use kind of a protective coating on the base of your crust. If you went to poke it and you will feel like, oh, maybe that was a little bit too big of a hole. Um, one of the things I like to do that's really delicious is you can make a black bottom pie which is making kind of a ganache with dark chocolate, milk chocolate, or even white chocolate, and putting that in the base of your pie. And it just makes this kind of delicious layer of chocolate in the bottom. But as a bonus, that chocolate also seals up any holes. So Great. a delicious solution. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, Derek, why don't you come in here? Um, my husband, Derek, who's filming this. I'm going to have him come in closer and show you some of the sizes. So this is about how big I want the biggest pieces to be, um, about the size of walnut halves. And the smallest pieces, I want them to be about the size of peas, like that, or a little bigger, because I'm making a flaky, flaky dough today. And now I'm going to make a well in the center, and I'm going to add some water. Now, this is a tricky part. Look how much flour I already got on the counter, by the way, because I've been like doing this with my hands, and they've got flour all over them. Um, I swear, guys, it does not have to be this messy to make your pie dough by hand. It's just me having a lot of fun talking about pie. Um, so a lot of pie dough recipes, I'm just going to get some water from my fridge here so it's nice and cold. Um, a lot of pie dough recipes tell you to only, they, they only give you kind of a base guideline for water. And I know that that can be really frustrating, especially for people who've struggled to make pie a bunch, because... But the, the reason why they only give a certain amount of water is because every single brand of flour is going to hydrate a little bit differently. And hydration of pie dough is one of the most important things. So for a double crust recipe like this, what I want to start off with is by adding about a third of a cup of water. That is not going to be enough. I'm going to have to add more. But that's the base amount that I tell people to add because it's a, enough to kind of get the process started. Um, I can't tell you exactly how much water to use without telling you, you must use this brand of flour. And, you know, you, I don't know what kind of flour you might have. Earlier this year, we had a flour shortage. So I don't want to tell you you have to use one brand of flour. So if you learn how to do it by eye, you don't have that issue. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is kind of toss it. Okay, so instead of mixing or kneading, I'm tossing the dough. And this starts to distribute the water throughout without actually like, you know, really mixing or kneading or kind of having any issues in that way. So it's, it, it all starts with a toss. And once I get it tossed, you start to see that there are like clumps that start forming. Like this piece is hydrated, this piece is hydrated, this is all powder still. So the first thing I do is just very gently and without handling it too much, try to break up some of the clumps so that, because basically there's water trapped in there in those little clumps and we want it to get distributed all throughout. Once I feel like that first amount of water is distributed as best as it can be, which I think this is, I'm gonna make another well and I'm gonna add a little bit more water. I'm not gonna be as generous this time. I'm just gonna add a few tablespoons because it's very easy to add a little bit more water. 
not so easy to deal with a dough that's gotten a little bit too wet. So that's where we'll start. Yeah, I think this is where I kind of initially tried to incorporate all the flour on the initial stage and wasn't really relying on the water to do that step. So it looks like you're getting a nice combination here. Yeah, that's, it's definitely really important. And like I said, now that same thing is true. I've kind of got these clumps that have formed. So I'm just gonna break some of those up. And then I'll, I might add a little more water. One of the things I start to do at this point though is because again, like I said, the water is hiding right in some of those places. Yeah. And it's really important not to add more than we need. So you can start to try to bring the dough together by like gently kneading it just a couple of times. And when you do that, you see this is what always happens. Some of the dough comes together pretty well and some of it stays powdery and in the bottom. So what I usually do is I just set that other stuff aside for a second, just on my work surface, mm -hmm. and I start to work with just this dough. And I might even dip my fingers into my water and just like flick water from my fingers into the bowl. This way you're not pouring water in and you might end up with way too much. You're just getting that little bit of water that's left on your fingertips. And we can hydrate just that powdery part that needed a little help. Now we can add the rest of our stuff back in. Yeah, that's a great tip. It's definitely not necessary, but like, it's just something that I've found if you're, especially when you're making big batches of pie dough, um, if you're making like a couple of pies for Thanksgiving or something, it can really be helpful. The hydration gets harder the more pie dough recipes you're making. So it's important to, you know, not add too much and end up with kind of a sticky dough. And you also don't want it to be too dry. Um, a lot of recipes, I think, scare people off of adding too much liquid. And uh, as a result, when the dough is dry, it actually is really hard to roll out. Um, people tell me a lot, my dough is crumbly. My dough, when I went to roll it out, it was so hard, I couldn't roll it out. And that usually is because there's not enough water in the dough. If there's enough water, it should be really soft and malleable, easy to hydrate. If it is, uh, you know, very difficult to roll out, it probably means you needed a, several more tablespoons of water. So when it's all done, just with a couple of kneads, and I think you saw, because I did it while I was talking there, um, this is what it should come together to look like. And maybe Derek can come in a little closer again. I'm really making him do his, his work today. He's got to earn this pie that he's going to eat for dinner. <laughs> Um, so it should basically come together, but it's not going to be completely smooth. Like some cracks like that are what you want to see. But when you put your hand on it and lift your hand up, I put, I'm putting the palm of my hand on it. Obviously there's dough on my fingers from mixing it, but I'm putting the palm right on it. And when I lift my palm up, there's nothing on it. It shouldn't be sticky at all. It should just become, have come together enough that it's kind of one piece, but not so much so that it's sticky or smooth. Gotcha. So what is the most amount of pie crust or pie dough you would make at one time? That's a good one at a time or? Usually by hand, I would make no more than four at one time. Okay. So get double crust, two double crust pies or four single crust pies. Um, and the reason for that is just like I said, the hydration gets very difficult to deal with after a certain point. It gets very hard to ensure that getting everything evenly. And I find that recipes when I try to make five or six, or seven, I just end up with some pieces that are too sticky and too wet. A dough that's too wet, if you're working with it, um, you'll just use a little extra flour and you'll think that's fine, but it'll be very, very tough when you go to eat it. So if you've ever had that problem where the pie looks amazing and it's golden, but you can't even get your fork through it, that is a pretty typical issue of the dough being too wet. Um, and that overhydrated dough makes it really crispy in not such a nice way. All right. Do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, we got a few more ones coming in here. Um, so this kind of fits with mine too. Somebody's asking, uh, Brittany B. 718, uh, blind baking for baked custard pies, is it totally necessary? 
Uh, and specifically, she's asking for sweet potato and pumpkin pie. I don't know if she's going to like my answer based on the way that she <laughs> phrased it, because yes. But I also have to clarify this again, because I do think people confuse par baking and blind baking. So par baking is what I would do for a pumpkin or a sweet potato pie. That stands for partially baking the crust before you put a filling in it that's going to be baked again, like a pumpkin pie. Blind baking is when you fully bake the crust because you're going to add a filling into it that doesn't go back into the oven. So I would not blind bake a sweet potato or a pumpkin because it would be too dark by the end of the time of the custard baking. But the reason it's important to par bake and why it really is a step you should not skip. Um, there just is not enough time for pie dough to bake in the time that it takes a custard like sweet potato or pumpkin to set. On top of it, custards like that are very wet. They have a lot of moisture in them. Moisture from the pumpkin, moisture from the sweet potatoes, moisture from the eggs, moisture from the butter, the bourbon, the whatever else you're putting in it that makes it taste like a million bucks. So all that liquid just kind of sits on raw pie dough. But if you give the pie dough a head start, the structure of the dough will be set when you add the filling. That way, when you bake the pie, you're going to end up giving it enough time for the crust to actually brown, not just enough time for the custard to set and for the bottom to be a soggy pie disaster. We don't like soggy bottoms in this house. <laughs> well, so I guess that kind of follows up with this next question we got. Um, it says, my pie, my pie crust always leaks butter. Uh, is there any way to stop that? So that was also one of the ones I was talking about a little bit before. The pie crust leaking butter, um, one of the reasons that that happens is kind of temperature disputes. So the first thing that I encourage people to do if they are consistently leaking butter when they make their pie crust, the first step is the easiest. It's when you're mixing and rolling your dough, you wanna make sure that the, each piece of butter is fully coated in flour. And I actually have an example right here at the top, if Derek, you'll come in close. This piece right here, I have a little piece of butter, and that piece of butter is a great size, but it is not fully coated in flour. I can see the yellow of the butter right through it. It's not great. If I rolled that out now and it was exposed to the oven temperature, even if that piece of butter was really cold, without that flour to protect it, it can be really problematic. So that's the first thing you can keep an eye out for is making sure when you roll it out that you don't have any big pieces of butter that are totally exposed on the sides or the surface. The other thing you can do that's pretty easy to do and I found is the, the culprit in a lot of these cases is to buy an oven thermometer. Oven thermometers are not a, an expensive investment. They're usually about $12 or $15. Um, you can even buy them in the grocery store sometimes. And it's just very common for home ovens to become out of calibration. Um, they can become not cal correctly calibrated pretty easily. And so to avoid, you might actually be baking your pie at 350 and you think you're baking it at 400. And that could be like it's leaking out. So it's a pretty simple solution of just knowing you have to set your oven a little higher, um, which can really be helpful as well. The last tip I'm going to give, just because I know that the butter leaking out is everybody's number one. No one likes that. It's such a disaster and it makes your kitchen all smoky and, and all that. I would recommend trying my extra flaky method, which is in my new cookbook. And I actually can show you right now with this dough that I just made. Normally I would chill this dough first, but I just wanna show you how easy it is to do this. And for people who are struggling consistently with the butter melting out, it's likely an issue of the handling. This extra flaky method is a little bit more foolproof and a little bit more flaky. So if you're consistently having trouble with it, you might wanna try this. It is an extra step, just grabbing my handy rolling pin. It's an extra step, but it's worth it, and it's pretty quick. So like I said, normally I would chill this for about 30 minutes first, and um, it's okay that I didn't because I worked very fast and we keep our house very cold because this is a pie household. So we, <laughs> we keep our house the temperature that the pies like. And I'm just gonna roll out the dough to about a half an inch thick. You're not really worried about exact size or shape here. We're really just worried about the thickness of the dough and we're aiming for about a half an inch. And once we get it to a half an inch, we're just gonna fold the dough in half mm. and then fold it in half again so that the dough is now in quarters. I'm gonna, you can just do that one time or you can do it two times, which is what my extra flaky method would be. And it basically just, um, those pieces of butter that we had, 
it's rolling them out thinner and kind of layering them with the dough. So it's a very quick form of lamination, like I was talking about with the rough puff pastry. But in addition, if you're somebody whose pieces of butter are not sufficiently coated in flour, that gives you a few rolls and folds to get that butter like incorporated into the dough to get it coated with flour so that that butter melting issue isn't gonna happen in the oven. Gotcha. Um, we're getting a question from Minx1030 on uh, how can you avoid burning your crust? That's a great question. Um, a lot of pies require being baked at kind of a high temperature. So parts of the pie can brown faster than others and that can be really um, scary if you're like trying to get a perfect double crust pie and one part is turning black. So um, they do make something that are called pie crust shields. Um, I have a couple of these that are made out of silicone that are really nice. Uh, they allow you, they just kind of wrap around the edge because the edge is one of the places in a pie that typically gets particularly more dark. Um, but there's an easier solution than that and one that uh, took many years of baking pies to think of. A lot of pies are brushed with egg wash um, because that egg wash helps brown the crust evenly and it also, the egg white gives it a little bit of a shine, which is very beautiful. Um, unfortunately, egg wash the entire pie, including the edges, they're encouraging the edges to brown more than the center. Whereas if you only egg wash the center of the pie and not the edges, since the edges brown faster anyway, by the time the pie is done, they will be at a very similar kind of point in browning. So that's another really helpful tip that I learned while writing this pie book. I had been doing it the same way for many years, and then all of a sudden I realized the edges are always getting browner, so why am I putting anything on them to help make it brown? Unnecessary, only egg wash, kind of your top crust portion. Yeah, that was a popular question that we had coming in here. It seems like everybody was interested about the egg wash. Um, one other thing that I was going to mention about temperature that I do think is important to know is specifically with fruit pies. Fruit pies are some of the most flexible in terms of the temperature. So if you're baking an apple pie this holiday season and it's starting to get too dark, just tent it with some foil and lower the oven temperature by 25 or even up to 50 degrees. It's going to take longer for it to bake, but there's a very easy visual cue with fruit pies, which is that it has to bubble. The filling has to bubble up through the vents or through your lattice. So if, as long as you bake it for as long as it requires for that bubbling to happen, you're going to be all set. And the fruit pies are very flexible in that way. So if you're finding consistently that maybe it could be that your oven's running a little bit hot, just knock that temperature down a little bit. And for the rest of baking, it won't brown quite as much. So since we deal with appliances, I know a lot of our customers are asking, um, what's the best mode on the oven to cook the pie crust on? Is it convection? Is it regular bake? Yes, great question. Um, I love convection always for the kind of uniformity of baking, but I don't always recommend convection for pies because when you're dealing with pies, you're dealing with some pretty delicate pastry structure. We were talking about how we don't want things to slide. We don't want things to be uneven. And I just find that the fan can actually sometimes displace the crust a little bit. So it's a really great time to just use kind of your regular oven settings. But that said, the convection is amazing if you're only um, like kind of in the finishing stages or if you're baking something like a galette, a free form pie, the convection is going to heat up faster, keep that heat more evenly. And I love galettes and free form pies, especially for people who are a little bit intimidated by pie baking because it's so easy to get that bottom crust crisp and no uh, par baking required. So convection for free form pies and galette, not for anything delicate like a meringue or a par baked crust. And then as far as the oven rack, where would you, middle, bottom? Ooh, yes, this is my favorite question. <clears throat> bottom rack because we're trying to get that bottom crisp right so especially if the heating element or one of the primary heating elements for your oven is in the base um that's where you want to keep it in the lower part to help get that bottom crust a little bit more brown i also sometimes enlist the help of a pizza stone or a baking seal on the bottom rack of the oven um, just to really help drive some heat to the bottom of that crust that's great great way to radiate around um so I know, that, I know this isn't specifically related to pie crust, but everyone's asking, I guess, because Thanksgiving's right around the corner, do you prefer canned or fresh pumpkin? 
Ooh, that's a great question. I have to confess, I usually am using canned because I'm making so many pumpkin things, but I also uh, will say that I love to use butternut squash in place of pumpkin. And it's actually something that I'll use leftover butternut squash for a lot if we make some kind of squash for dinner here in our house, I'll puree the rest of it up and turn it into a pie. So uh, I would say usually I'm using canned pumpkin, but I'm also sometimes subbing in fresh butternut squash and you may not know it. <laughs> Sounds like a healthier option. I don't know if it's any healthier with all the butter <laughs> I'm putting in it, but let's say yes. Oh, so we had that question too. Is there a healthy alternative to using all this butter for the pie crust? No. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Of course there are. There are lots of great, um, great things to use. I just love butter the most. Um, one of my favorite things to do that's a lot healthier, and I do this sometimes for us for like uh, savory pies, um, you can use leftover grains like quinoa and bind them with a little bit of egg white, press it into a pie plate, and it actually bakes into an incredibly crisp crust. You can do that also with, you know, uh, rice, any kind of grain that you've already cooked that you kind of have left over hanging out in the fridge. Um, another one that is not necessarily healthier because it still has a lot of sugar, but it is healthier in terms of being totally fat free is my meringue pie crust, which is made with whipped egg whites and sugar. And it's this very marshmallowy, crisp on the outside, soft on the inside crust. You fill that with fruit and whipped cream and it is one of the best pies ever. So good. And then uh, I think now we're getting on to the, uh, the types of pans. I see like multiple people asking about aluminum, glass, metal. What do you prefer? So I prefer either ceramic or metal, but metal has the added bonus of being very nonstick. So um, I don't know if you've been following me for a while. Some of you might have seen that the sign of a pie being done. I wonder if this pie in the fridge will let me do that. No, it won't because I didn't bake it in a metal pan. <laughs> Um, when a pie is fully baked, you can lift it right out of the pie plate. So you can see that the bottom is crisp. It kind of releases itself. And ceramic, while it does a great job of getting the crust baked on the bottom, which is one of the things I love about it, it doesn't do as good of a job of being nonstick. So you kind of have to find the right ceramic pan. But metal pans are really, really nonstick. And they do a good job of equally, evenly distributing the heat. Um, I thought it would be the opposite, actually. That's, uh, that's interesting. It's also, I was going to say, I, I don't really like glass. And I used to recommend glass a lot because I used to be teaching a lot of beginning pie bakers. I do love glass for beginning pie bakers because you can see through it. So you can like actually see, is it baked enough? And you can kind of look at the bottom of the pie. And when you're learning, that is such a great way to do it. And that's how I learned to bake pies was using glass. It's my least favorite material now that I've found some materials that I like better. <laughs> Any other, any other good questions in there? Um, yeah, a lot about the, uh, a lot about the Thanksgiving type pies. Um, I guess as far as, you know, you just went through this whole process of publishing the book. Um, what, what is your favorite recipe out of the entire book? Do you have just one? Oh my gosh, that's like asking me to pick my favorite child. It really <laughs> is so hard. Um, actually, I'm gonna take you really quick into my living room and show you something very cool. Um, hope you don't get motion sick. <laughs> so on the wall behind me here, you can actually see every pie photograph in the entire book. I've got them wow. up on the wall here. So that's one of the reasons why I'm coming over here is to look and see which one I might be able to say is my favorite. Today, I'm going to say my favorite is the birthday cake pie. I love the birthday cake pie because I'm trying to make birthday pie as popular of a thing as birthday cake. I don't understand why it isn't. So let's make birthday pie happen, guys. Birthday pie. Hashtag. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so with uh, the amount of like pie recipes you pump out seems pretty incredible. Like, are you coming up with these just on the fly on your own? Like, where do you get the inspiration for these things? Well, that's, that's always a tough question to answer because sometimes it, it's really obvious. It's like, it's rhubarb season and I want to make a new rhubarb pie. Um, but other times it's, you know, a specific inspiration. Like I get inspired a lot by um, people that I know, uh, people in my family, and I'll start thinking about something that I know that they would like and that it doesn't really exist. And so I want to make it for them. Um, so that's one of the places that I, it's a pretty constant source of inspiration. Oops, sorry. 
sorry. <laughs> we had technical difficulties there. Recently, um, just to be real and talking about real life situations, recently my wireless headphones have been connecting to my phone mysteriously throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly you were in my headphones, which are in another room and not in my ears. Um, but yeah, I think I think that one of the things that um, continues to inspire me about Pi is how versatile it really is. You can basically look in your fridge and look at what your leftovers were from dinner last night and turn that into a pie. So that's one of the things at the end of the day that always, like, I kind of come back to is just how versatile it is and... I never seem to run out of ideas for that reason, because there's <laughs> always more stuff to pie-fi. <laughs> Is there a pie you don't like? Wow, that's a really hard question. Is there <laughs> a pie I don't like? Um, me, I, I like... used to actually not be a very big fan of pumpkin, but when I was okay. writing my book, I was like, I have to have a pumpkin pie, and possibly more than one, because everybody loves it. And I tested the pumpkin pie so much that now I love pumpkin pie, because I, like, I made pumpkin pies that even a pumpkin pie hater would love. <laughs> <laughs> nice. For me, it was the, the chicken pot pie growing up. For some reason, that was like, never do I want that ever again. Yeah, I, um, I have a great chicken pot pie recipe oh. cookbook, but it's, I confess, um, it's not a chicken pot pie. It's just a chicken pie because it has crust on the bottom and the top. Because I don't want more crust, you know, like more crust all the time. <laughs> um, I actually had another question just come through here. That's kind of a good one. Um, can you freeze your dough already rolled out into the pan um, before baking it? And I actually don't recommend freezing for extended periods of time once the dough is rolled out. This is sort of a long explanation that I'm still trying to work out some of the science of. It's completely fine to use the freezer for a quick chill but you wouldn't necessarily want to roll out your dough and put it on a baking sheet and leave it in the freezer for a couple of days. Um, it can just kind of cause, I found that for some reason, butter that has been frozen sometimes behaves the way that we just discussed, which is it loves to melt out of the crust and it has to do with kind of the temperature. Um, uh, there's all kinds of ways, but that's one question that came through that I thought you might want to know too. <laughs> so when you're rolling out the dough, is there a way, it, it seems like, I know you said uh, like a particular size, is there like any tricks to making sure you get it the right height? Yeah, I, well there, now they make all these great tools that are really great if you're someone who struggles with rolling. They make rolling pins that have kind of like specific widths. So you pick a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch or whatever you're going for. Um, and I know that people often have a, a bit of a hard time keeping it round, which is something that just comes with a little bit of practice. Unfortunately, I know that's always, you know, so much of baking is, is truly muscle memory. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to give my hands a quick rinse here. <laughs> this is a true live scenario. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's basically, I think that um, you, you want to make sure that you're not, uh, you want to make sure that you're kind of giving it that temperature iteration at any given time is 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 always what it comes back to with, with pie <laughs> yeah that was we actually we had to buy a rolling pin and we did get one of the ones with it. it was stainless steel so it kind of released a little bit easier off of the rolling pin too and it had the rolling the little adjustments on the side which was really nice well and somebody in the comments up here just reminded me that my friends at food 52 just created a rolling pin that also has like measures along it so if you're trying to figure out oh is it 10 now is it twice? it's right part of the rolling pin which can be really nice so that you're not like lifting it up to try to see if it fits in your pie plate handling it a bunch more than you need to basically at any time that you're handling it more than you need to it is it's too much for the dough it's just gonna get warmer it's gonna melt you know all of those things that we don't want okay what are, as far as order of operations um this was something we ran into where we were doing kind of the two things simultaneously. And then we were kind of waiting for the pie crust in the fridge and then the, the custard was done. Um, how, do you, how do you time these things out? So I think one of the best things to do, and I think this is actually true with a lot of baking, not pies. Like I think it's actually really true of cake and other bigger projects um, in the kitchen. But 
things that that I do is kind of just break it up. So I make the pie one day, and then maybe I par bake it the next day, and then filling and bake the pie the day that I eat it. Um, a lot of steps are really friendly to being done ahead, and it takes away some of that feeling a little bit like you're waiting on the pie because I just said pie defies. So that's something you can do, just kind of breaking it up a little bit. It's also something that makes pie a little bit easier to work into the average week. Pie is something like bread that people will think of as being very time consuming. There's a lot of hands off, a lot of just bridge, you know, like like how bread dough rises. So um, that's some of my, just up a little bit can make it a little bit easier. I usually make dough, obviously first. Um, I do usually look at a recipe and I think, is there anything from the filling that needs to be done before I even start the dough? Like roast the butternut squash? Do I need to toast the pecans? Um, that thing that you said before about how you didn't read the recipe all the way through mm -hmm. is, I would argue, one of the most common problems that people saying, I didn't read it, I didn't see that there was that. And that example, because that's not an ingredient. So yeah. what called for, so you didn't, you know, see it in the list when you were doing your shopping, it makes total sense. Yep. No, great. Um... Did you have any other just general tips that uh, you don't think we covered here? Well, there was one question that just came in. Someone was asking about pre-cooking fruit fillings for pies. Okay. And I do think that pre-cooking fruit filling for pies is one of the best ways to get a really consistent result. That thing when you cut into a pie and it's just like liquid, that usually happens. Um, well, it can also happen because people love to cut their pie while they're still warm. And one of life's things that after spending all that time baking, Pie. You have to let it cool before you can slice it. It's impossible. It feels so hard to do, but you do have to let it. But those that liquidy with fruit, it's a lot. It's very difficult for a recipe developer like myself to predict how juicy the fruit is going to be. I don't know if you're trying to make a pie with frozen peaches in December, or if you're making a peach pie in July, juiciest peaches in the tree from your backyard. So one of the things that's really is if you're using a pre-cooked filling, it helps adjust consistency before you bake the pie. That way, if you have really juicy fruit, you kind of know and have dealt with it and captured all of the flavor um, rather than not knowing until the pie comes out of the oven. Great. Awesome. Trying to think of any other specific, um, if you guys have any other questions, I guess, ho holler now or forever hold your pie. Mm. <laughs> Oh, somebody's asking gas versus, on the appliance side, a gas oven versus an electric oven. Do you think that oh, makes a difference? Gas, baby. Gas oven. Oh, yeah. You're going to have a hard time meeting many professional chefs that don't like using gas. But I say I do have some electric induction cooktops in my house because that is really great for regulated things like sugar cookery. Um, so I, that's, the, that's the problem when you've got a real true professional we want all of the things i want all of the and all of the ovens and all of them. i just want one thing please thank you for, but, for baking traditionally we tell people i think or the the common knowledge is typically that electric is better because it's more of a consistent heat um what that, is it about gas that you like right yeah for sure that would definitely be true especially in like a professional environment like you don't go into a, a chocolate bake shop um and find flames typically but what i like about gas for doing the kind of work that i do at home is that it's um the fastest and most consistent like i can really control all the way down to that bare simmer but that's exactly why i mentioned it for sugar cookery in particular making something like a caramel because it allows you you can eat specific temperatures sometimes on some of those electric cook yeah. and you're working with precise things like baking you can't really beat that. That is like just the sh assuredness that it's going to be right. And as a bonus, if you're doing something like sugar cookery, you're not heating up the area around it, just like you said, so that when you pour it out, it can cool in the appropriate time. Yeah, somebody just mentioned in the comments too, uh, dual fuel, so where you have kind of the best of both worlds, where you got the gas cooked up and the, uh, the electric oven. But I said, I was like, I just want everything. Can I yeah. just have five kitchens, please? Then I will yeah. be <laughs> the induction is so nice for cleaning, though, and you probably appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that's the, um, we're cleaning the stovetop just about, 
because we're making it dirty. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think, I don't think I have necessarily too many more things. I guess I'll grab my, my book here. This is the book, guys, the book on pie. And it comes out tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I, there's lots of information on Instagram about where you can find it. And we're going to save this amazing Pie Crest 101. So it's going to be in my Instagram feed so that you can come back and refer to when you're making dough in a panic in a few weeks, possibly. <laughs> well, congratulations on the book. Uh, I know that's an incredible accomplishment. You must be amazingly proud. I'm very proud and very happy and very nervous because <laughs> it still isn't really out in the world yet. So for everybody that's watching today, be sure to let me know what you think of it because I'm biting my nails over here. <laughs> what you all uh, think. To see all the pies everyone bakes up. And for some of our lucky followers too, um, so we're having a contest starting on November 11th. Uh, so if you follow us at Designer Appliances, uh, we're gonna be, and you tag two of your, or one of your friends, you can enter for a chance for you and your friend to win a signed book um, from Aaron. So good luck with that. And signed books are few and far between these days because we can't meet in person to sign too. So this is a, a very special giveaway. I'm so excited that we're making that happen. Great. And Aaron, you know, with our company too, we like to always inspire our customers after they buy appliances, just because, you know, they buy the thing and then they use it for a month and then they lose the, the excitement. So pre pandemic, we would always have like in-store cooking uh, demos and classes. So hopefully one day when we get out of this craziness, hopefully we can have you in. That's exactly what we were talking about and why we decided to do this live is because I had to come, I wanted to come in there and bake a bunch of pies. <laughs> But we'll still do that sometime down the line. And in the meantime, everyone can just bake all their pies at home because homemade pies are the best anyway. So yeah. we'll bake homemade pies at home and please share them with me. And I can't wait to see what everyone bakes. You too. <laughs> I'm going to have to post my picture once I finish tonight. <laughs> I need to see it. I need to know how it turned out. Most importantly, how much you love it. That's the best. Thank you so much, Erin. And good luck. Thank you, Ari. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> Bye.